behind your back. I don't give you a blackboard anymore. I give you just this space in the blackboard. And you've got to write everything in a single line. And then you need the instructions. And the instructions say, go to the end of the second number. So I go down my line, like i got one little I. Hmm, eight. Okay, now go back past the plus sign until you see the end of the other number. Oh, there's a two. Now add those two together and see what the result is. And put a special sign here, equals, and put the result over here. And then remember that one in a finite state somewhere and go all the way back here and look at the second number here. Oh, so maybe you should like mark this off with a special symbol, like an X, so you remember that you passed it already. And mark this off with a special symbol. And now go back and do the same thing. 7 and 5 is 12. Add the one that you had in your finite state somewhere, and you're going to get uh, 13. But now push that 0 down so it's out of the way. And put your 13 here. Your three there, and then remember you had the one, and now cross these two out, go back. Well, if you hit a plus sign here, that means there's no more symbols there. So go all the way here. There's a three here. You can add in your one from your carry final, from your carry uh, finite state. Three plus one is four. Shift these down again, and you're done. I'm doing this because. What Alan Turing was thinking of when he wanted to strip away the notion of computation is he said, do we really need the blackboard? Do we really need to be able to write in two dimensions? What do we really need to do computation? And he stripped it away to what he thought was the barest minimum. And if you read the introduction to his original 1936 paper, it starts just like that. He goes, what do you really need? It's just the convenience to write in two dimensions. It's just a convenience to have lots and lots of symbols. We could just have two symbols and encode everything in zeros and ones. Think of how much worse that description would have been if they were all zeros and ones. Every something that I did, every addition would have you know, 10 or 12 instructions. So it's like your simplest two-line programs in Java become 400-line programs for a Turing machine. Not quite that bad, but that's the spirit. It is not fun to write programs for a Turing machine. It's important to do it only to the point where you've convinced yourself that it really has as much power and as much generality as these more convenient models. So that's kind of an intuitive introduction to what a Turing machine is going to be. It's going to be a model of computation that's equivalent to any of your programming languages, but with everything stripped away down to its bare minimum. And even then, it's technically a little difficult to make mathematical arguments about computation. Even then, some of the proofs are a little tricky. So without that, there's no way at all. People for thousands of years had a notion of computation. Euclid in 300 BC describes the greatest common divisor algorithm. And it's very algorithmic. It's very step-by-step -step how to get it. But nobody really captured the essence of what we think is a computation versus what we think is just logical human thinking until the last century. And that was carefully formalized by Alan Turing and at the same time by Alonzo Church. Church and Turing. They did it independently. Turing came up with what we call a Turing machine, which is a little bit like this funny method of computation I just described. And Church came up with a lambda calculus, which is very, very closely related to uh, the language scheme that you spent a month uh, programming it. You probably did a few weird theoretical lambda calculus extra credit kind of problems. I imagine John Pizarus would have done that. It's kind of his style. Uh, anyway, you can describe any computation with the lambda calculus. You can describe any computation with a Turing machine. How can I prove that? Well, it's kind of no way to prove it, because what is computation? What these things really are are definitions of computation. The 20th century has come. We want to formally def define what we mean by a computation. And a computation is no more nor less than something a Turing machine can do. So there is a sometimes called, a, I don't know, a Church-Turing thesis or hypothesis or, or, um, or, or assumption. It's nothing you can prove, so it's not a theorem. And it basically says that what we normally think of as a computation, what we normally would all agree upon as humans, that this is a computation, is exactly what you can do with a Turing machine. No more, no less. 
Now I should point out that this is a mild point of contention. There are some people who feel that maybe there are some computations that we can do as humans that are not modeled by a Turing machine. But that's more discussion for Patrick Winston to talk about if he gets into that area in AI. There are some nice books by Roger Penrose, who's a physicist who talks about quantum mechanics and the idea of what you can really do with a machine. And maybe there are things, organic things can do that are more powerful than any machine because of quantum mechanics at the basis of our structure. And there is no quantum mechanics at the basis of these, uh, of these Turing machines. And it's a big subject. It's complicated. It's mostly philosophy. And we're not going to get into it at all. We're going to believe the Church Turing thesis that what we think of as computation is perfectly reasonable to be thought of as what a Turing machine does. And I tried to give you some sense of Alan Turing's discussion as to why. He describes addition and he says, look, you can do addition on a long tape. It's just a pain in the butt. Okay, that's basically the idea. All right, so we filled in our diagram. Now we're in decidable land, w, w, 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. These are things that weren't context free. Now they are acceptable by a Turing machine because you could write a program to do it. Here's something that's more complicated that you can write a Turing machine for. Uh, how about things, uh, strings w, x, here, pound sign x, pound sign y. W, X, and Y are binary strings. And accept any strings like this where if you add W to X, you get Y. Okay, so in other words, accept things that show you understand addition. Turing machines can also do output. I mean, I can have the Turing machine take W and X and spit Y out. It could also do that. But we like to keep things in the accepting uh, world, rather in the recognition world, rather than in the uh, computation output world. We didn't do any output with finite state machines except in how computers work. We didn't do output with context-free languages except in parsing. The output comes in applications. But from the theoretical point of view, you can always think of computation as yes or no, do I accept or not accept. So this is the, st the string to show you understand how to do addition computations. Wx, where the sum of them equals y. How do you write a Turing machine to do that? It's a little like the Turing machine I was writing here, a little bit. In fact, of all the, I am going to give you a few Turing machine programs to write on your own, because you should get used to it. You should get a feel for it. And of all the ones I ask you to write, this is by far the most complicated. You're going to have a big, big page with some long English description of how it's working. And it, it's going to be quite involved. Today, I hope we'll get to some examples that are a little simpler. We'll do this one, for example, today on the board. And this will be a little complicated. Basically, uh, I'll call them odd numbers. Recognizing odd numbers in binary. You could actually do that with a finite state machine. Uh, numbers are numbers with ones at the end. So that really all the way in here. But you could write a Turing machine to do it too. And then the very last problem, which is much harder, it's not here, 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 it's really out here, is prime numbers. Go ahead and describe to me a method writing numbers down in binary in a single line to go back and forth and somehow figure out whether it's prime. Step-by-step step instructions. This is so tedious that the problem says, think about how tedious it would be to write a Turing machine to recognize all prime numbers. And that's all you have to do. <laughs> but you do have to write this one. You do have to do enough of them so that you get a sense of how to do it. This is, you'll even find a nice paragraph in Mike Sipser's book about this. About, about, he discusses you know, how much programming you should do with Turing machines. And he basically says what I'm going to say now in a nutshell, and everybody believes this. Do you have to be able to write Turing machine programs? Well, you've got to be able to know that you could do it if you had to. And as soon as you're good enough, then you don't have to do it anymore. So, you know, you can just say I'm good enough, even though you're not. But, <laughs> You're just fooling yourself. So do a few until you feel you really get the idea, and you could do it, and you feel it's nothing but tedium, and it's not any new idea. And at that point, you stop. And I think when you get to this one, everybody will be there. You put it on your resume? Oh, yeah, that'll help you get a job. So, well, I've programmed many Turing machines. <laughs> oh, come right out here, please. There's our Turing machine department. Just please close the door on your way out. <laughs> yeah, well. Where are we? OK, this is all meant to be intro. Other questions so far? I'm kind of moving on to this slowly, because I really want you to get the big picture. There's some very deep, interesting results, and some very mechanical things as well. But I, I don't want you to lose the big picture before we move in.
Questions? Yeah, Todd. Uh, code versus data. Does it, can a Turing machine modify that? Or 